Well, good afternoon again, and thank you all for coming out. Yesterday, there were 15 national public opinion polls released. And if you average those, you end up with basically a statistical dead heat. That is to say, Obama, Obama, <laughs> Obama and Romney are running neck and neck in the 15 national election polls that were released yesterday. This suggests that the election is going to be determined by the relatively small number of undecideds who, are, who remain that way even today. In this highly competitive environment, campaign ads are key. Survey data tells us that the average voter is likely largely politically uninformed, and this is probably even more so for those who remain uncommitted as we head into the final two weeks of this historic campaign. Capturing the attention of the electorate, and in particular those choice undecideds, through a 30 or even 60, 60 second ad is key to courting voters, even though communicating meaningful policy differences across a variety of issues in such a short time frame is virtually impossible. Nonetheless, the candidates are duking it out on the airwaves through ads that address such wide-ranging issues as entitlement reform to women's issues. To date, something along the lines of over $500 million have been spent on campaign ads alone, and the estimate for the final tally is expected to reach over a billion dollars. That is a billion with a B. What we want to look, but the interesting thing is we've not likely seen many of the ads that we're going to show you today. So much of the campaign is being waged in battleground states, and blue New Jersey is not among those. In fact, compared to what folks in Ohio and Florida and some of the other battleground states are likely experiencing, folks in New Jersey are likely scratching their heads and asking, what election? We're simply not being exposed to the kind of uh, you know, saturation in ads that, that others in the battleground states are experiencing. What we want to do today is take a step back and assess the efficacy of some of the Romney and Obama ads through the eyes of both academics and practitioners. We'll all look at these together, many for the first time, and have a conversation about what messages the candidates are likely sending to voters. To help us, we have three esteemed panelists, each of whom brings with them a unique perspective on campaign advertising. First, we have Professor Dan Casino, who is a professor of political science here at Fairleigh Dickinson and one of my most favorite colleagues. He's also an analyst with Public Mind. Dan has published widely on a variety of issues related to American politics having to do with attitudes and behavior, and he teaches classes along those lines as well. To his left, yes, is Julie, Ku Julie Kuki. She began, she began her career as she's an expert in branding, or the art of helping others discover, clarify, and sharply articulate what they do and how they do it. Or in other words, helping others identify their brand essence. She is currently the owner of 98.6 Brand Expression Agency, where she has been for the past decade. Prior to that, she was head of strategy for the Nick and Paul Brand Agency, creative director for Faith Popcorn's Brain Reserve, and a host of other places that tapped her creative genius. And finally, to her left is Mike Lesser, many of whom you've already become acquainted with through his two previous uh, great lectures here in the, as part of this series. But for those of you who don't know who Mike is, Mike began his career in political advertising when he worked on the Nixon campaign as part of the November Project. Since then, he's gone on to have a brilliant career as an ad man, ad man with Revive Personal Products, where he was CEO, as well as the former chairman and CEO of Low Marshalk Advertising Ag Agency. These are our panelists, and we welcome them today. I want to start off by getting the panelists to look at and respond to a few ads that are addressing issues that are central to this campaign. First is entitlement reform. As any casual observer of politics knows, Medicare needs fixing. Medicare spending grows yearly with no signs of abatement. However, the, how the candidates address this important issue is critical beyond what it says about their approach to entitlement reform, but also for the message that they end up sending to a key constituency the over 65 crowd, or to put it in electoral terms, definitely a population you do not want to alienate. So I'll first show you Governor Romney's ad on Medicare, followed by President Obama's ad. 
We'll then turn it to our panelists to splice it and dice it and tell us what they see in regard to uh, communicating an effective campaign strategy on this important issue. So first we see Romney. Some think Obamacare is the same as free health care, but nothing is free. Obama is rating $716 billion from Medicare, changing the program forever. Taxing wheelchairs and pacemakers, raising taxes on families making less than $120,000. Free health care comes at a very high price. The Romney-Ryan plan will restore Medicare funding and protect and strengthen the program for the next generation. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. That was Romney, and now for President Obama. It's true. Mitt Romney would replace Medicare's guaranteed benefits with a voucher system. The Romney-Ryan plan could raise seniors' costs up to $6,400 a year, while under President Obama, a 75% increase in health care fraud prosecutions, lowering seniors' Medicare premiums and out-of-pocket costs, and eliminating $156 billion in wasteful Medicare subsidies to private insurance companies. A difference that matters. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. I think that um, I, I agree with the, with what's being said. Uh, the the I don't see the first commercial uh, as so much of an ad about Medicare as I do a, a commercial about the health care plan. Uh, essentially, I think what the communication there is is that there are no free rides. Pe people, uh, particularly people that that these commercials are talking to, think seniors and think Florida for a moment. But particularly those people uh, w want to know that, should I repeat all that? No. <laughs> uh, 
the, the, there's an unwritten communication in both commercials, I think. And I think you have to stay with the visuals a little bit and forget the words because I agree completely with Dan and Julie that the words are almost inconsequential. The, the right brain part of these commercials to me are the first one says healthcare reform, which you think is a good thing, folks, and I'm talking now to the electorate that they're addressing, that you think is a good thing comes with a price. And here's something to worry about. It comes with a price that will cost you on your Medicare. And that's something, obviously, that seniors are very worried about. The second commercial, I think, forget the facts again, because <laughs> the facts are a lot of things that are written there more, I think, for press coverage and a lot of other things. But the visuals there are from Obama, and he's saying, uh, I care about you. And, and, and the essence of all political advertising is that, is that I understand what it's like to be you, and I care about you. After that, uh, you can pretty much disregard the words. Okay. Uh, there's actually one very interesting thing in this ad that we saw in the Obama ad. This is something you almost never see. This is an attack ad. And almost always an attack ad, and we'll see this throughout the rest of this. The, uh, the I approve this message. The personalization of the message comes beforehand to try and distance the right. candidate from the negative message. This one, it comes afterwards. And I think that's interesting because what that's, he's trying to show, you notice it's not just the, his face and saying, I approve this message. Instead, it's President Obama walking forcefully and dramatically through the halls of the White House. He's trying to project strength. He's trying to project security. Oh, I'm still here. I'm taking care of things. I'm in charge. Don't worry. So it's almost a reassuring thing at the end of this attack ad. Be scared of Ryan Romney, but you can be safe with me. The second thing is in all of these ads, and again, we see this a lot, are these theoretical newspaper headlines that are not actual newspaper headlines from anywhere. They are completely recreated for these ads. They'll, but they'll match the font, they'll match everything to do to make it look like a newspaper headline with the idea that, well, you might not believe this crazy political ad telling you something, but this is the New York Times telling you something. Or this is some news source that's in tiny, tiny letters on the bottom of your screen that you can't see without your 84-inch plasma, but there's a source there. So it's the newspaper telling you, don't believe anything on the internet, but it's in a newspaper, it's gotta be real. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I was gonna add is, and this is true for all these ads as you go through it, I, I can't help, I mean, just after many years, I just look through all communication through the brand lens, which is simply a hierarchy that has to start with the brand that you're selling followed by the facts that ladder up to that. And the only thing that will stick is I have to know, first of all, who is my guy or woman? What do they stand for? What's their core? Or alternatively, who's the guy I'm attacking or woman? And what is the core of their problem? And so my issue with this is Obama's core has to be, you've got to assume, caring, right? He's the caring guy because he's going to look at Romney and say he doesn't care about 47%. So if you're gonna be, start that way, I don't understand you doing an ad that isn't you every single shot <laughs> with an old person helping them <laughs> and being caring. And then do the facts underneath that. But if everything has to ladder down from who am I? All right, what's the main thing that this is saying? Is this saying Romney's wishy-washy? Cause we gotta keep saying Romney's wishy-washy. You know, we gotta keep saying I'm steady and competent. Whatever it is, you've got to start with that and then follow the facts. Both of these add to me are too fact forward. They're just too fact forward. Let me, um, I, I want to, uh, we're talking tactics and we haven't really talked strategy. We're touching on strategy. So l l let's just put this into a strategic context for a moment. Um, as you all know, the incumbent has a huge advantage, a baked in advantage uh, in a contest like this. Uh, he is the president and the other guy wants... <clears throat> the incumbent has a huge advantage in, uh, in, in any contest, anywhere at any level, but particularly of this kind. Uh, the incumbent should win. 
if things are absolutely awful, uh, as in the Jimmy Carter presidency, it's a different story. But but uh, it's very rare that the incumbent doesn't get reelected. Think about it. Everybody who voted for them the first time is basically committed themselves already, and that's a majority of Americans. Secondly, that person is the president. You don't have to imagine them being president. You don't have to worry about what they will do if they're president. All the things that frighten us so much when we have to make this decision you know, are answered by the fact that there's an incumbent. The challenger has to convince you that he can do a better job. And in the case of Romney, he has uh, a presidency that I, I, I would judge to have certain mixed results. I mean, I don't think that it's a presidency of great accomplishment uh, to work with. So the incumbent has to defend his record. This is, this is the arc that goes over, over everything. Has to defend his record, and the challenger has to say, I can do it better. Okay, what we will get to is the, the parts of that, because almost everything we'll see will be the incumbent saying, what we have is pretty good, don't give it up, and the challenger saying, here's why I can do it better. If I could say, I think I saw a germ of that in the Obama ad, because he was almost pitching himself, I think, as sort of, as the conservative among the two, because his ad struck me as being about conserving the, the existing system, as opposed to, you know, what, what they allege Romney's going to do, which is rate it and, and establish a voucher system. So it's interesting that you point that out, because I kind of saw a hint of that, and although not fully fleshed out. Yeah, um, David Axelrod said, a great quote, uh, want some, that every campaign is an MRI of the soul, <laughs> and that you eventually, by the end of the campaign, you will see the inside of that person. And to me, it, the, the thing, like it or not, the thing, the brand essence for Obama is steady, patient, rational, right? Steady, patient, rational, which is why the socialist wacky stuff never sticks. You can say stuff that doesn't, if it's not attached to the brand essence or if it's going face against the brand essence, it's, it's just gonna bounce off. If you say shifty to Nixon, it's gonna stick. <laughs> if you, sorry, if you say, um, um, but if you say, if, if you were to say, uh, uh, you know, about Romney, you know, incompetent or something, it wouldn't stick. It, it's just there's, there's got to be those things, so that's why you're but seeing you can, it. But you can, in a swift boat sense, and I'm probably yes. getting way ahead, yeah. the, the basic premise of the Romney argument is I can do better because I was a businessman, a very successful right. businessman. So now you have opened that as basically the entire foundation of your claim that you can do better. And you've opened that to challenge. So I'm sure we'll talk about that as we yeah. go ahead. Oh, definitely. OK. Uh, do you want to go just to the positive ads? Could you do the Believe in Our Future? Can I do one more? Oh, of course. One more, and then I'll turn it over. Yeah. So I just want to pivot a bit and now get, our, get, a, get the um, topic off of something specific like Medicare and something a little bit more general, and that is there's been um, an attempt by the Romney campaign to try to persuade people who voted for Obama, who were caught up in the excitement of electing the first black president, um, you know, very, very much supportive of the hope and change appeal, and trying to get them to basically say it's okay. It's okay that you gave him a chance, but it's also okay to say that it didn't work out. So I just want to show one ad. This actually was from a super PAC, Americans for Prosperity, which is, a, of course, a conservative um, organization. And see what they think about this, and then I'm happy to turn it over to Dan, who has a little bit more issue-based ads to show you. In 2008, I voted for President Obama with no reluctance. He presented himself as something different. I had hoped that the new president would bring new jobs, not major layoffs, not people going through major foreclosures on their homes. He did get his health care through, but at what cost? He said he was going to cut the deficit in his first term. I've seen zero interest in reducing spending. He inherited a bad situation, but he made it worse. I think he's a great person. I don't feel he is the right leader for our country, though. I still believe in hope and change. I just don't think Obama's the way to go for that. The president 
has not earned re-election in 2012 in my book. I've seen his now definition of hope and change. It's not the hope and change I want. It's not the hope and change I thought I was going to get. I don't feel that I helped my grandchildren by voting for President Obama, and I regret that. Americans for Prosperity is responsible for the content of this advertising. I, I love the use of ethnic groups here. So who are the voters trying to reach out to? I've got a woman with the Star of David necklace, in case you didn't notice. I've got a Hispanic woman, and I've got someone who's worried about their grandchildren. All these people vote for Obama, and they all regret it. So you probably do too, at least you're a swing voter, because if you're a white working class voter, we already got your vote. And if you've got a master's degree, well, we're not worried about you. We're worried about these very almost crudely defined ethnic types, which I think is fascinating that we're still able to go on TV and just try and make it as subtle as possible. You know, no one's wearing a yarmulke, but there's definitely a Star of David there. What I think is so effective about this ad is when I saw it, I, I just got chill, scared chill, <laughs> which is because, you know, you look, I look at every ad and I say, and I start with a basic question, two basic questions. Who are they trying to reach and what's the insight? If I can't see a human insight in there, then I'm just not thinking it's that terribly effective. The insight here to de detach Obama from all the emotion around the, what the country felt, everybody felt, almost, about this nation, what a great thing we've done to elect Obama. Just even if you didn't vote for him, my neighbor did not vote for him and said at the time, well, good for us, right? To detach him from that and say, we need to detach that because you're not gonna give up that vote without going, what am I doing? I feel so bad. And to detach that is brilliant. It's I agree. I, they should have stopped the commercial after the woman who said, yeah, I love I Obama, uh, but he's just not, whatever her language was, he's just not equipped to be president. He's not that's, earned my vote yet. That's an end line of, of yeah. a commercial. And if they ran that to death, I think that they would, uh, <laughs> be enormously effective. I agree with, with what's being said. Can, can I ask a question because it'll help me to, to make uh, some kind of remarks that make some sense. Uh, are there any undecideds in this room? You're the one. So. <laughs> Do you yes. live in Ohio? <laughs> are you a woman? Oh, all right. I mean this, th th this uh, response I think is very interesting. It is uh, to me anyhow because uh, all the information is in and I'd love to know what the undecided person is waiting to learn because there's so much there's going to be another 200 million dollars spent talking to you and trying to get you to decide and, and, and I'd love to know what's missing right now from the discussion because what we're going to see today is that just about every element of a campaign can be out there. When I was involved with the Nixon campaign in 72, we spent less than $10 million on national advertising, most of that in swing states. So, so picture you know, what, what it seems like to me when I look at the enormous amount of pressure that's going against the undecided voter right now. OK. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who has some more I'd like to show. Uh, Do you want me to stay up? I'll stay up here. Just tell me which one you want. Oh, uh, can we go for Believe in America, Believe in the Future. Believe the, the in Rami the Future. Ad. So I thought it was interesting to actually look at some positive ads. Now, it was not easy to actually find positive ads this election cycle. There haven't been many of them for good reason. The reason you have positive ads is to introduce yourself to the public. And we already know who Barack Obama is. And Barack Obama got out very early to try and introduce Mitt Romney as being an unacceptable alternative. And so Mitt Romney didn't actually have much time to run ads. He also had a bit of a uh, problem with his cash flow situation right before the nomination. Uh, so he had trouble with that. But let's take a look at what a positive Romney looks. This is the stereotypical positive American political TV ad. Believe in our future? Yes. Okay. My own experience was I got the chance to start my own business. I know what it's like to hire people and to wonder whether you're going to be able to uh, make ends meet down the road. Freedom and free enterprise are what create jobs, not government. From those experiences, I, I went off to have the chance of running the Olympics in Salt Lake City in 2002. I came in and found that we had not only a scandal to deal with, but also a financial crisis to deal with. By the time the games were over, we had about a 
$100 million that we put into an endowment there for the future Olympic sport. The real experience was in Massachusetts. I found a budget that was badly out of balance. We cut our spending. My legislature was 85% Democrat. Uh, and every one of the four years I was governor, we balanced the budget. I want to use those experiences to help Americans have a better future. We believe in our future. We believe in ourselves. We believe the greatest days of America are ahead. Believe in the America you built. Believe we can build it again. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. All right, so there's a couple things about this ad that we know is right off the bat as being stereotypical. Where is Mitt Romney campaigning? In a small American town with white picket fences and everyone waving American flags and the sunlight filtering through the flags. And this is classic ad. We see the iconography everywhere. Uh, second, when do you think it was last time Mitt Romney drove his own truck? <laughs> right? But we're going to have him driving his truck because you drive a truck. Okay, if you're the person you're trying to reach, you drive a truck. And he's just like you. He's just got experience. He's done this before, so he's competent. Uh, number three, uh, we also see a lot of, we might like a cinema verite style. This is not highly polished footage. This is kind of, you can see it's a little bit of a Dutch angle. The angle on the, on the camera is a little bit skewed. The filtering's on the camera is a little bit off. So why do you make your image look worse? Because you're, because they know the viewer's trained to not trust highly glossy images. But if you see a video that was sneaked out of some secret meeting, well, you trust that, right? <laughs> So if the more we can make the video look like it's something you weren't supposed to see or something that's not quite ready for prime time, the more we're going to believe it. Uh, and the last part is I think what turns this from being a purely positive ad into a slight attack ad, which is at the very end, he says, believe in the America that you built. Well, the use of you is always going to imply them. You built America, and there's some nebulous other out there that didn't build America and is profiting from the America you built, or is trying to take away your America, and we're going to stop that from happening. I think the most remarkable thing about seeing this now, especially given how the Romney campaign has gotten wise later, is the fences aren't just white. The people are white. <laughs> there are no, there is no diversity in that, which is shocking if you're talking about it's not just small town America. I mean, they got very wise to that later when they, you know, he's speaking Spanish on Univision. He's like, he, it, but this was just, I was looking at every single cut. It's really white. There, and, and I don't know if it's conscious, it's, it's worth noting. And if it's unconscious, it's worth noting. This also goes back to a, a point that Julie made uh, earlier. That, I, that when I heard it, was reminded of years ago when I worked on the Coca-Cola business. Um, and we, we gathered uh, one day while we were planning the miracle that was New Coke uh, <laughs> for the world. And we gathered in a conference room. And if, you, if those of you who can go back to that in your memory, uh, th those were the years when Coke was sort of the Norman Rockwell brand that, you know, Main Street America brand and Pepsi was a little edgy and trying to be younger and sharper and a little bit, uh, you know, differentiate themselves that way given the fact that two soft drinks are more or less uh, undifferentiatable. But what we did on that particular day was somebody brought in mounds, boxes and boxes of scrap art and we were taking the scrap art in what seemed like a silly exercise and looking at pictures and saying, this is Coke and this is Pepsi. And, uh, and almost everything we looked at had a way of going on this table or that table. Um, you, you can do that in a political campaign. And what, what the people who made this commercial, I have a feeling this commercial is early and I have, a feeling, early. I have a feeling it's Iowa, but but the people who made this, this commercial. July 31st. OK. Yeah, not it's that early. Not that early. Um, <laughs> it feels but, so long ago. But the people who did this commercial are trying to use cinema techniques to give Romney something that he doesn't hold naturally, which is uh, spontaneity, you know, which is realness. And, uh, and I, I think it's wrong to do that. I think you go with the strengths, and you don't try to make your candidate into something that they're not comfortable being. And I think that's at the, that's at the center of what's 
flawed about this commercial. Uh, as an aside, I can tell you as an old-time advertising guy, I personally hate it when they're saying one thing and the words that they're putting on the yeah. screen say something different. Maybe it's because I'm too old or too dumb, but I can't listen to you and read something different at the same time yeah. and know what I'm supposed to be paying attention to. See, I actually so, disagree uh, with them. I think this ad, that's one of the reasons that I think actually works pretty well, because I can watch this ad on mute and I get the entire ad. <laughs> well, no, I, I can watch, if I have this ad on mute, I don't hear a word they're saying, I say, Okay, Mitt Romney likes small town American white people. He drives a truck. All right, good. I mean, this is the entire mess I'm trying to say anyway. Uh, the other thing I say is, I'm a, I guess I'm a little more cynical than you are, because I look at that and I, I, I notice there are no non white people in there, and I go, this looks a little bit like a dog whistle. This looks a little bit like, look at the white people that built America, and there's some nebulous other out there. We're it's not going to say who, away. who's taking it away. Yeah, and I, I, that's why I said if it's conscious, it's, it's conscious. But yeah. the, the thing to me that's interesting is clearly they're saying let's get him out of the boardroom, yeah. out of behind the desks, because that's how people think of him as a businessman, always in a suit. Let's get him out. I look at this and I go, that's how every account guy I ever worked with looked like on the weekends. <laughs> like, you know, he has duck pants on. This guy, it looks like the most, it, it's just not relaxed. And to, to your point about the, the camera work, that's an overlay on here's a guy who's really uncomfortable driving a truck and being stiff and, and you know eating those that kind of food and so let's make the camera shake right and they gave us in uh, in 60 and 72 they gave us a bunch of shots of nixon that they wanted to use and one of them was the classic kennedy beat shot i don't know if you remember yeah. this but there was nixon with his pants rolled up on the beach in oh. San Clemente uh, with wingtip shoes on, <laughs> uh, and he just didn't get it. You, that's not how you walk on the beach, you know? <laughs> well, that, yeah. That's the kind of contradiction that I think it, Julius It's Dukakis is. in the tank. Yeah. It's like, wrong. Stop, <laughs> block that. <laughs> uh, can we go for a, an attack ad? Because, you know, the positive ads aren't interesting. I love the attack ads better. Uh, how about the, Mitt Ron the uh, Barack Obama ad, Important? Which one is like, it? Important? I like half the attack. Uh, I think it's, oh, that one. There you go. Important? Yes. Okay. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. I think Mitt Romney's really out of touch with the average woman's health issues. This is not the 1950s. Contraception is so important to women. It's about a woman being able to make decisions. I don't remember anyone as extreme as Romney. A cut off funding to Planned Parenthood? I don't think Mitt Romney can even understand the mindset of someone who has to go to Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, we're gonna get rid of that. I think Romney would definitely drag us back. Okay, there's a couple things about this ad I love. Again, we get really great subliminal messages. The first little message, I'm not sure how close you can see it, is the tricycle in the corner. There's a brightly colored tricycle, I know because my son is the same one. Uh, there's a brightly colored tricycle in the corner with a woman talking about contraception, how important Planned Parenthood is. So what's this, what's this tricycle saying? Well, she already has kids, but she still cares about contraception and abortion. It's not just an ad for, you know, girls gone wild, right? Contraception is an issue for everyone. It's important for everyone. And so mothers care about this. And so an attack on contraception, an attack on Planned Parenthood is an attack on mothers an attack on women you know. So they name the women. We use average looking women. I mean, these, I, the, you know, they're gonna say, oh, they're real people. They're not real people. I, we all know actors are all androids. They're not real people. Uh, but they are people who are supposed, actors are supposed to look more realistic. Saying these are your average people. We've given them names. And so now they're gonna tell you these scripted lines about how important contraception Planned Parenthood is. And how Mitt Romney is entirely out of touch. So. The idea is they want to use the Planned Parenthood attack against Romney, but they don't know how to do it. So how do you say Mitt Romney will shut down Planned Parenthood when most people are in America, the swing voters are going, well, I don't want an abortion, so what does it matter to me? So we have to try and personalize that to everyday American women. Yeah, and I think the other subliminal thing that they did, which I loved, was the moment, to your point about locking up visual audio cues, the moment they said 1950s, they showed Romney wearing an alarmingly thin tie. <laughs> and he's a good dresser. So I was looking like, did they retouch this? How did they get him in a madman tie? And he, so they just said 1950s and he's in a white shirt and a skinny tie. 
It was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> the the um, this issue is uh, one of the deciding issues, I think, in the election, and I I think Romney uh, is on the wrong side of this if you're going to count up votes. Um, and Michelle. <laughs> And, and, I, and I think they can't, if I were involved on the Obama side, I would believe you couldn't do too much of that kind of advertising. Yeah, and the other thing that was good was, that I was kidding about the 1950s thing, but what's smart about that is they're laddering up again to something bigger, right? So you could stay on the level and be pretty effective just talking about he doesn't get women. But they're laddering up to a bigger thing that they're saying about the Romney brand essence, which is he's out of date. He wants, to, which is what happened in the debates last night. Yeah, the 20s. binders, yeah, the binders full of yeah. women. <laughs> Stuck is, because of that. Yeah, is a phrase yeah. that reinforces that point. I mean, who even uses much. binders anymore? <laughs> and who knows what binders full of women are, except <laughs> businessmen who say, get me some women. Right. You know. <laughs> so uh, I want to go to an attack ad, a light attack ad that Romney ran against this, all starting about women's issues. This ad's called Melanie. Uh, Romney ran a pretty recently this October 6th ad uh, on Romney talking about women's issues as well. I'm disappointed in Barack Obama as my president because he promised to bring us all together and we're all going to be able to prosper. I don't see the prospering. In 2008, I voted for Barack Obama. He doesn't have my vote this time. Why Mitt Romney? Being a woman, you think about your children and you think about their future. And what I want to think about is a future that has jobs, our economy's growing again. That's important to women and it's important to me. I'm Mitt Romney and I approve this message. So, now we have an ad about women's issues for Mitt Romney. Except women's issues have nothing to do with contraception or abortion or anything like that. The women's issues is now the economy. So how do you feel? How would you if you feel like you're losing on women's issues? You try and reframe the issue. Well, women's issues, women's issues are really the economy. It's that women have lost jobs, and so we're going to strengthen the private sector, make it so strong they'll even hire women. We're going. To, so this is the. I love that pivot he gets in there. So this is theoretically a positive ad, but then goes about and has that sort of soft attack that Mitt Romney, uh, sorry, that Barack Obama doesn't understand what women really care about. And of course, it's also almost a jibe at the women watching. Are you, what are you worried about? Are you worried about your own contraception? Or are you worried about your grandchildren, your children and grandchildren? How selfish are you that you're worried about contraception or abortion? You should be worried about the real women's issues here. What, what I don't understand, though, then, about that is, I understand the reframing of going, you know what? The biggest women's issue is the economy. But then why spend money on doing then have, then if that's true, then all your failing economy ads work against women, right? Just put more women in them, put both sexes in them, both genders in them. Why waste your money on doing a specifically female ad on the economy? The rest of your ads are doing that, if that's really what they care about, so. I, I agree, I think it's forced, and I, I think it's intellectual and forced and that's uh, all you really have to say to know that it's yeah. probably not effective. I, you know, and I think the other thing about it is that uh, they're really, they, they, are, they are trying to turn everything to comics. So Bra Mitt Romney looks at the poll number and says, people trust me more in the economy. So I'm going to make every issue about the economy. We saw it in the debate last night where he tells us the biggest foreign policy issue is the economy. And you go, wait, that's not a foreign policy. What are you talking about? But every issue has to be at the economy, so you try and reframe everything. And it's not necessarily an ineffective strategy. I don't think that particular ad worked, but trying to make the entire oh, thing yeah. referendum the economy is, is the only thing. It is. Got. To me, it's just a waste of production and uh, a buy, because if it is true that women care about the economy, all your other economy ads are going to work. Um, I think it would have been extremely effective if you had what you just said earlier, which is you make it more, make it more overt that it's where a woman is saying, look, I mean, how effective would it be, look, I care, I do care about Planned Parenthood, I do care, but you know what, more than that, I care whether my grandkids are going to have a future, I care about, make it overt that they do care about these issues and one trumps the other, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, next I would look at is a, a great negative ad. Uh, this is a character. This is an ad right in Ohio from Barack Obama on October 15th. 
Growing up in Ohio, you learn to size up a person by their character. And that's why I'm supporting President Obama. He stood firm against the doubters and helped rescue the auto industry. He's taken on big corporations and foreign powers when they've threatened our jobs, our freedom, our way of life. And you know he means what he says. That's the Ohio way. Barack Obama has earned my vote and my trust. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. That's, that's the best ad in there. Well, you know that they've had this in their pocket for months. I didn't read that anywhere. It's just clear that you don't waste John Glenn uh, when you have him. This is like a, uh, this is your canon. You're in Ohio. You have an American icon. Uh, he's also a very, very convincing, endearing, lovable spokesman. I mean, this is your perfect political commercial, and it was saved till October 15th because uh, it can carry Ohio for Obama. Yeah, and I've seen it, you know, four or five times on Facebook. I didn't even know it ran in Ohio, mm -hmm. which, you know, is an indication of how local are things. But the interesting thing about it is, going back to my earlier point, it is right on the brand essence. His brand essence is steady, character, trust, solidity. No one is going to go, you know, you don't know where he stands. That, that's not the issue. And so this is right on his brand. It, it's, it's the best ad in here, I think. Right. And, and the reason I like this as a negative ad is because when people see, so imagine you're Ohio right now. In Ohio right now, four out of every five ads on television are political ads. The local TV newscasts have cut their running time by three minutes to accommodate showing you more ads. You are sick and tired of attack ads. So how do I make an effective attack ad? I get a nice guy like John Glenn to say nice things about President Obama, and then at the end say, he means what he says. Are, are you implying there is someone who does not mean what he says? Yeah, of course. So you've got that great soft attack in there. You, know, you don't even feel the stiletto going in. So it, it is. So you get that trusted figure. People aren't going to dip through uh, John Glenn while they might do through attack ads. So you want to see what John Glenn has to say, and you get him to make your attack for you. But you don't make it that overt an attack that's going to turn people off. Yeah. I, I don't see that as an attack ad. I mean, I see all political advertising <laughs> as the essential communication is don't vote for him, vote for me. Uh, Generally speaking, as we all know, it's more motivating to know the reason why I shouldn't vote for him than the reason why I should vote for you, because I'm not going to believe you anyway. You're a politician, and nothing you say really resonates with me. But, but what's wrong with him, I'm much more likely to believe. I, I don't think John Glenn is there to attack Mitt Romney. I think he's there to endorse. But I think, and I that, think that endorsement is as I said, I think that endorsement is enormous. But oh. that, that line stands out as a more pointed, sh sharper line than the others. In other words, you could do an ad. It well, always he knows is, how to give emphasis. Yeah. He's, he's a professional. But, but that writing of that line of he means what he says is about as close to a, an attack as you can get in a, within the context yeah. of a positive and, ad. And within the context of what I'm sure John Glenn is comfortable saying. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, John Glenn's uh, not going to say anything nasty about someone else, absolutely. Right, right. Uh, do you want to move over to, and I'd like to, I'd like to do one issue advocacy ad. Sure. Uh, this one's Decisions. It was run for the Mitt Romney side on October 3rd. Uh, let's see. Okay. Decisions. Decisions. Okay, let me just get this going. On here. the, uh, oh, I think oh, it's okay. the one that Caesar has. Uh, Go ahead, you do it. Caesar has in the window. Will more spending get the economy moving? President Obama says yes. He's dramatically increased federal spending and added $6 trillion to our national debt. Mitt Romney says no. We can't afford the spending and borrowing that hurts more than it helps. In a second term, Obama will spend more and borrow more. Romney won't. The choice for America? Obama, more spending, more debt. Or Romney, more efficient, effective government. A brighter future. American Future Fund is responsible for the content of this advertising. <laughs> All right, so a couple things about this ad that's interesting. So first off, we have to remember, this is an issue advocacy ad. This is, in theory, not an ad about the election. This ad has nothing to do with the election. How do we know? Because it avoided what they call the seven magic words. It never told you to vote for Obama. 
or vote for Romney. It never told you not to vote for someone. It never told you to send someone to Washington. So it didn't tell you to cast a ballot. So therefore, it is not officially an ad about the election. Uh, second thing I like about it, uh, the campaigns refer to this as a contrast ad. He wants to do this, I want to do this. But this is the most unbalanced contrast ad I've ever seen. He wants to have awful, wasteful spending that hurts more than helps. He wants to make government more efficient. Let's just do it as a contrast rather than as, as an attack. Uh, third, and I, this is again more of a subliminal message than we normally get, look at the use of color. So with Obama, we signify Obama with red and Mitt Romney with blue. And in fact, if you look at the picture, they actually whitewashed uh, Romney's tie. R Romney's actually wearing a red tie. They, tra they painted it, photoshopped it blue for this ad. Why? Well, that's a, that's a switch on the normal partisan signifiers, but the reason is red is the threatening color. He's going to do awful things where blue angelical Romney over here is going to protect you and make things better. Yeah, I think uh, the, I look at this and I go, that's the kind of ad Romney would do if he were writing advertising. <laughs> it's got the check boxes. It's like, it's the most un, it, it's so left brain. It's like, check, check. It's all head. There is not anything. So even if you're going to say a lot of spending, better, more efficient, it never comes down to, why should I care about that? It, even if, so if you're in your head, you're calculating how that is, but you're leaving it to me to go, hmm, yeah, I guess if we do the debt, eventually my kids won't, hmm, I bet that's not going to be good for the country. Ima imagine if it had just had gone one step down further to, this is what this means in human terms, instead of check box, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I can't imagine that ad persuading anybody <laughs> of anything, but, but, um, but I, but I do want to point out that, um, that, that there's almost another uh, seminar subject matter in the amount of commercials that are done, uh, n not necessarily to persuade yeah. anyone of anything. Uh, a good example is a spot that Axelrod commissioned um, a month or so ago about Romney's stance on women's matters. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the commercial got Romney's position wrong, um, I think deliberately. And I think all that Axelrod really wanted was for Romney to spend a couple of days uh, responding to that spot. And there's a lot of that that goes on that is tactical and that is designed to win a news cycle. I have lots of stories for you about how you win a news cycle. But the way to win an election is not with those tactics. The way to win an election is to work on this portrait that you believe is the winning portrait and have everything you do reinforce that. Your view of building a brand is the exact same yeah. idea of yeah. the way to win an election. We have time for just one more. Question. I think we have time for one more, and then. We'll uh, why don't we do? Uh, why don't we do earned uh, the Obama attack ad from uh, October 9th? Uh, this is an ad targeted senior citizens. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. Victims, dependent. That's what Mitt Romney called 47 percent of Americans, including people on Medicare. But what about his plan for you? Romney would replace guaranteed benefits with a voucher system. Seniors could pay $6,000 more a year. A plan AARP says would undermine Medicare. You are no victim. You earned your benefits. Don't let Mitt Romney take them away. Okay, so a couple things on this one. I, I love the fact that the 47% comments in the secret video now is so ingrained. You don't have to quote say. from it, you just kind of show, here's a grainy video of Mitt Romney talking. He's saying something awful. Second, I like, he actually is doing exactly what you said he should be doing before. That is, here's Barack Obama helping an old person. And now here's Barack Obama, uh, now he's saying, all right, this 47% comment, he's personalizing. There's a lot of news, so he's saying, Mitt Romney is saying that because you are on Medicare, or you're on, that you are a victim. And therefore, he's saying bad things about you. He doesn't like you. He's not going to take care of you. And, but you're not a victim. You can do something about this, that is, you can vote for Barack Obama and vote against Mitt Romney. Uh, so it's, I love that pivot at the end. You can fight against these awful people that want to take away, take away Medicare. Also, again, notice, it's an attack ad. How do you know it's an attack ad? Barack Obama is at the start of the ad. 
because he wants to distance himself from the attack line at the end as much as possible. I, I still think that this would have been much more effective if they had actually played a clip of Romney saying this, and here's why. I think it, it is it is very naive, this ad, in it doesn't understand the level of cynicism, especially, I mean, my daughter's in college, and I hear all of her and her friends, they just don't believe anything anyone says, except for the things that were secretly taped. The thing, I heard it, I heard it, it's true. So when they're saying it, you've taken it out of his mouth and into advertising, it's immediately not true. I mean, look, you still have people like my parents who are in their late 80s who believe everything because it was in the news. It was an ad. It has to be true. But everybody, you know, young, the young are just like going, I don't believe it. So you've lost so much credibility by taking it out of his mouth. That 47% uh, is the gift that keeps on giving as far as Obama's concerned. I, there's no way to misuse that as far as I'm concerned right. because it's um, it, it when you hear it uh, in actuality you believe that that's what this man believes and uh, and what happened with the 47 percent and I think I'm agreeing with both of you a bit here but what happened with it is that it somehow got separated from Romney and and Biden who I thought was awful in the vice presidential debate. I know you love him. Um, but Biden found a way. He found it on the stump how to personalize that. You know, how to look at each one of the people that he was talking to and say, are you in that group? And, and what does he really mean by that group? And these are the people that I care about. These are the people I love. He brought that home. Obama brought that home in the last two minutes of the second debate. That debate, for me, was equal until those last two minutes, and then Obama had that, and I think he got that way of approaching it from Biden. But, but that uh, and the women's issues, I think, are what will turn this election, yeah. ultimately. Well, uh, and that 47% comment is, is, is awful. It's well, just awful. Well, but Mike, I mean, the problem with Obama has these in the 47% comment, I, I'm sure if he could, he'd just take out a half hour on TV and show that video to everybody. The problem is that people, by and large, agree with them. Say, yeah, there's a lot of people who don't pay income tax. Hate those people. And nobody knows who they, they, they and nobody believes they're part I, of that. I so understand. like you said, Biden, you have to personalize somehow. You have to bring it You can't just home. show the comments. I, yeah. I understand. But every time, Rom, if I were advising Romney, I would advise him not to say that thing he says about, <laughs> I care about 100%. Yeah. Right. Because every time you say yeah. the 100%, what people are hearing, is, oh, he's referring yeah. to that 47. The way he's bringing it up, and, and every time they can get him to bring it up is uh, another advantage that goes to the Obama I mean, the, the way to use that 47% to me would be to, again, hang it on the thing that everybody, even the people that are pro-Romney, tend to believe, which is, He's a little shifty on his positions, depending on who his audience is. So don't hang it on the fact that he believes that 47% are dependent, because you're right. Secretly, a lot of people are going, yeah, kind of true. <laughs> What's happening is you put that next to him going, I care about everybody. And it's like, well, which Romney is it? And now, boom, you've got the thing everybody can agree on, which is he says whatever he wants to say, depending on his audience. So. And I'm, I'm actually been surprised recently. On the past two weeks, we've seen Obama on the stump using he has he has talked about Romnesia. The that, Romney says one thing, and how and that. how there isn't an ad on that, I don't know. I know yeah. why has that not become a meme? I mean, if everything else is like so, no. yeah. Well, even on the internet, it is a meme. The Romney a debating bit. himself. I mean, yes, they have, yes, yes, but you true. know, again, I don't know why they haven't used it. Romney. Well, you know that they had that forty-seven percent three or four months before. Sure, they're yeah. waiting. Yeah. Yeah. that was timing. This you've got to go back and restudy this campaign from a standpoint of what, what sort of message they were crafting month by month, because, uh, because I'm going to give Axelrod a lot of credit in terms of understanding what he had to work yeah. with. He had, that, yeah, he had that one huge unexpected setback, which is Obama going to sleep in the first, mm -hmm. uh, first debate. Mm -hmm. right. And that's what they're trying to recover from. If not for that, yeah. this thing was a cakewalk, yeah, and, no. it, and it was totally as it was designed by Axelrod, yeah. with the timing included. Yeah. 
I think at this point we'll turn it over to the audience for questions. I'm sure you might have some. I would like to take a moment to thank our panelists for yes. this great presentation. Uh, so uh, Dan Casino. <laughs> Julie Kuki. <laughs> Michael Lesser. <laughs> and of course the moderator, Krista Jenkins. So now I'm going to facilitate the questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll approach you with a microphone. Uh, if you don't mind, I will ask the first question. Uh, just reminding the audience real quick, the title for today's presentation was Obama versus Romney, who is winning the campaign war? So now I was wondering if you could, each one of you go across the table and tell us, in your opinion, who has won this war, whether it was uh, President Obama or Governor Romney, and why you believe that? Well, if I'm sorry, I would, I would actually say in general, I think Obama's ads have been more effective, uh, mostly because Obama's ads have actually been more, much more on the attack ad side, where Romney's have been more defensive in general. So Romney, at least when he's not talking about the, his ads in the economy, been fairly effective. The ads on all the other issues have been much more on the defensive side, kind of responding to attacks rather than making attacks or uh, and really defining himself. And that's one of the problems he had, is that for a challenge, we didn't see any bio ads. And that's bizarre to me. I was expecting June, July to see all bio ads, like the truck ad we saw. You know, this is Mitt Romney's story. And we didn't get those ads. You didn't even get it at the, at the convention. Yeah. And you I, didn't I, get it at the convention. I, I had no idea why they didn't do those ads. That's, that's practice 101. You introduce yourself, you know, and you didn't do it. Yeah. You know, I think who's winning the wars, it's hard to say. I mean, what's interesting is you look at both of them had a huge deficit to overcome. Obama had to overcome the literal fact that the economy is not growing as fast as, fast as impatient Americans feel like it needs to. And there are a lot of people out of work. Romney had to overcome all the deficits that people have poured out during a bruising Republican uh, lead up. So all those things he had to do. I, I think both of them have overcome to a certain extent. You know, Ro uh, Obama has managed to reframe the debate. Romney has managed to humanize himself a bit and, and do what he needs to do. But, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. Back in, in the, when, when Mike was doing these ads, they were so big and the, the buy would reach three quarters of the American public any given night. These are so specific. So I can sit and look at the television and go, that's horrible. And somebody over here that they're really trying to reach is going, mm -hmm. interesting, you know. You just don't know. The, yeah, the, um, the Obama goes into this, as I said earlier, with uh, the better hand. <clears throat> He's an incumbent. We know him. Uh, a majority of us have already voted for him. That's huge. Uh, Romney goes into it, and first he has to go through a bruising primary campaign. So the first awareness of Romney comes from people like Santorum and Gingrich and others telling you what's wrong with this guy. So, so your first awareness of Romney, forget advertising for a moment, but as you're forming an impression of Romney, it's coming basically from a definition of Romney that is being perpetuated by his own party. Uh, very, very difficult. It's one of the reasons that the incumbency is so powerful is that the incumbent doesn't have to go through that and doesn't get battered and bruised all through the primary season. Now Romney's argument, basically, his whole premise, and it was basically the wrap up of his acceptance speech at the convention, is that I will get more jobs. Okay, that I think uh, is misguided for me because it's not really big enough. I know it's an emotional issue. I know that people who are out of work hate being out of work. I know everybody feels like the economy should be doing better. But the difference between full employment and, and, and high unemployment is two or three percentage points in the unemployment numbers. It's, uh, it, it really doesn't affect many of the people who are in this undecided column. Uh, and the people who are in the undecided column who are out of work have totally different issues than, than people who would be being addressed by this. I don't think Romney ever had 
a good enough argument at the start of this. His argument essentially is uh, things are getting better, but I could have done it better than that. Now talk about a giant abstract uh, to convince people who now see some progress being made that if he were president, it could be even better than that. The thing that the Obama camp had to do was to undermine his credibility as a businessman. Uh, those of you who have uh, history in business uh, will also know that someone with uh, Romney's background is really not a businessman. He's really a financial guy. Uh, he probably never ran a business in his life. Right. And uh, that's a little too abstract for anybody to attack. But the fact of the matter is that uh, Romney is a businessman. That's his only claim here to be the guy that you can turn to at a time like this. Uh, may I point out that the last time we had a Republican businessman for president, his name was Herbert Hoover, uh, and it hasn't worked out. So yeah, what I, don't, what I don't understand is it's always amazed me that that the Obama camp didn't frame say say that that Romney isn't a businessman. He's a finance guy because there is universal distrust right now about finance. So I don't. I never have understood why they haven't really we're framed it that to way. Mr. Undecided. We're going to find out why. <laughs> I, I, I actually do think it's too subtle a distinction for people to draw. Because they'll I say, think, I own a business, maybe. I'm a business But man. I think, you, you know, the question is who's winning the advertising wars? You can't separate the advertising from the strategy, and right. I keep going back to strategy. The Obama strategy is the right strategy, and most of what he's doing tactically reinforces that strategy. Romney is finding out that it's a bankrupt strategy, I think. And I think that the next round of polling is going to shift pretty dramatically in Obama's favor. And I think Obama is going to win the election. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm less I'm less optimistic than you are about President Obama's chances, because uh, I, I, it, it is very, it's pretty tight. Uh, but I do think that there is a messaging thing here, where really Mitt Romney's strategy has been, look, we have to go and wait for unforced errors. And that's, we're gonna sit tight. We saw in the last debate last night, the whole idea was I'm just going to not say anything crazy. And I'll take a little bit of a beating, but I'm okay with that, because I'm just gonna sit tight and hope that something goes wrong for Obama. And it, look, the polls are almost tied. I mean, you know, it, it, it worked out, that strategy has worked out okay for him. Yeah, I think, I think in general, I would say Obama's advertising and strategic, the people behind it are way more disciplined. I think that it just shows, to Mike's point, an extreme amount of discipline. Stay on, you know, go follow every news thing with quick response. To me, Romney's, at least at the beginning, for a good long time, felt undisciplined to me. I think Rove got a hold of it pretty <laughs> tight, you know, into it. But it just felt a little like there are too many things out here. And, and Obama was really disciplined. But can I just ask a question in regard to that? Because there was the one ad that we didn't play, but I'm sure you've probably all seen it. It's the Big Bird ad. Um, and, and that, yeah, and that strikes me as one of those ways in which the Obama campaign was, Bad. in fact, that was undisciplined, undisciplined, right? Stupid. Because they basically jumped on it and, and you know, pivoted very quickly and turned a, an ad about Big Bird into something Stupid. that was, and from what I understood, it was, it was largely criticized, right, among people who knew. I mean, the problem with it is you're playing right in, the minute I saw it, I was like, no, the people that are trying to save PBS are everything what people say is wrong with the Democratic Party. <laughs> right. It's elitist, it's... PBS, it's a, I don't care that every kid watches Sesame Street. By the time you're an adult, you, there are tons of people who go, PBS, elitist, egghead. You, you don't do it, and you don't make a joke about Wall Street. And this is a serious stuff. It was really undisciplined. I, yeah. I think it was a bad commercial, but I don't think it was a bad tactic. Um, I, I, the commercial was, a, was um, odd, to say the least. <laughs> but. But, um, but you know that there's a history of trying to eliminate funding for uh, public television. And, uh, Going back to and, Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of Republicans have gone there and sort of gotten their toes sizzled and stepped back from it. And I, I have a feeling the same thing would happen again mm -hmm. with Romney. And I think what we were dealing with with that response 
was some inside communication I think it was. Mm -hmm. that it was taking place. It was a, it, I agree it was not designed to be, a, it, it didn't work. Yeah. But, uh, but there, is, there is something in that moment when that was the best thing that Romney could come up with of the things that he would cut yeah. in order to bring the budget yeah. in line. I mean, that's the real charge that is being leveled against him is that there are What's the plan? no specifics to mm -hmm. any of this, and that's the only specific. That's the way I think I would have attacked it because it's a, it's a very, show very how small it is. Yeah. Right. And, and silly thing to be attacking. Okay. I actually think strategically it was an awful ad from a strategy, uh, strategy, uh, from a strategy standpoint. Uh, and that's mostly because if your whole idea is Mitt Romney's this terrifying guy who's going to take away Medicare, you can't make him terrifying and cartoonish. If he's cartoonish, oh, he's this silly guy who just wants to cut Big Bird, then he's not scary anymore. It, it's, and it's, he needs to be the monster. It is my father's problem with hope. My father's a Holocaust survivor, and every time he sees Hogan's heroes, he just. He wants to throw the TV out. It's like, you cannot be both Hitler and funny. Oh, those clownish Germans, <laughs> you know? It's exactly that point. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another ad, actually, we didn't watch, Super PAC ad, that's like cartoonish about Paul Ryan. Like, you can't make him into a cartoon. Yeah. He has to be terrifying. Yeah. Now, now, that said, if Romney wanted to make Obama look inept and cartoonish, I think that could work, but I don't think the reverse message. It's kind of terrifying to kill Big Bird. It <laughs> Questions? I'll take a question here. I generally don't watch ads. I watch PBS. <laughs> <laughs> but I was wondering, did he propose any ads? Did Obama have any ads uh, defining Romney as a very poor governor? Yes. There's actually a lot of them about how he was 48. The, there was 48th in the country in job night, growth, yeah. and there was there the actually he did have ads attacking his record as governor. I don't think they've gotten a lot of traction because it always winds up being how do you want to slice the numbers this way? So you know, and, and there's there's profoundly dishonest ways of talking about Romney's things as governor. So Mitt Romney's ad says he has the best record of any governor of this decade. Well, there's been two governors in this decade. One was still in office, and uh, he was there in 2008, so his record is awful. So, so there's two governors, so it's a, but the Obama way of defining isn't great either, so that's just dueling numbers. If, if I uh, were in charge of the Obama campaign, I, there was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago, uh, it's a weekend New York Times, I think, and it, it dealt with where Romney was when various important matters were being discussed uh, when he was governor of Massachusetts. Does anybody remember that yeah. article? Um, I would have done a commercial on that yeah. article, not because uh, the accusation against Romney would have been that he wasn't present during some important matter or other. I would have done it for the great pleasure I would get from showing where he actually was, which was at four or five different multi-million dollar vacation homes. Uh, just being able to show that here he was in Vail and here he was, you know, in wherever he is in California and so on, just being able to show that if, if you are anything like an average person looking at it, you come to the conclusion, he's not like me. And that's really what all political communication is about. He's right. not like me. Right. Also, I think there's, a, there's an inherent problem with doing anything that reminds people that he was a governor. You either have a, you know, resume where he's a business guy, or, you know, remember, governors are running their own little countries. So you wouldn't do that to uh, No, I would do the, what you just said, absolutely. I would always do what you just said. Um, that one is good. I just think, you know, they, d they haven't really talked about the fact that he was a governor. Uh, it just gives him experience. Well, and actually, I think there's another strategic reason not for talking about his time as governor. Because you talk about his time as governor, well, well you, want, you might want to talk about that. But you can either, I think you can either define him as a flip-flopper, he doesn't have any core convictions, right. or you can define him as terrifying. Because if I try and do both, I'm going to say, he says all these horrible things, but it doesn't mean anything he says. It's like, oh, I shouldn't worry about the horrifying things he says. So I think they have to choose how they're going to attack him, and they chose for Mitt Romney as Satan, I mean, rather than the uh, flip-flopper attack. I, I think they're, I don't think you can do both. And I think this side, the Mitt Romney, you know, scary ad is more effective. We have I think another, we have, yeah, one more question. Uh, yeah, we have a comment coming from here. 
the media has media has been accused of being quite uh, far balanced in the favor of Mr. Obama and not without some good cause. That includes radio, television, newspapers, and so forth. How does the Obama campaign manage to silence the media when uh, Romney is raising such things as raising the national debt from $4 trillion to $17 trillion during his campaign? or borrowing the huge amounts he has from China. Not much publicity about that at all. It's silenced. Uh, you're saying that, that you're in the camp that believes that the media is biased and, and distorts the coverage of the campaign. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't see it that way. Um, I, I think that that's uh, a charge that gets made when, uh, generally, when somebody on the right does something wrong or stupid and it gets covered by the media. Uh, the, I'll give you an example. Of, first of all, just you know, to cite some facts, the number one cable channel, obviously, is Fox News. And that, if you know, we don't have to discuss which way its political leanings are, the number one newspaper in the country is the Wall Street Journal. I don't think you have to discuss what its political leanings are. The number one, two, and three uh, commentators on radio are uh, very much right-leaning commentators, starting with Rush Limbaugh. Uh, there is a, a, a very significant amount of information coming from the right side of any particular question. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when the 47% video was released, I was watching the network news. I was watching uh, Brian Williams on NBC. And, uh, and they played the 47% tape pretty much it's in, in its entirety. And then they went on to show something that Obama said in 1998, OK? That, to me, was a misguided effort on the part of the so-called liberal media to give equal coverage to a news story that really only had one side. The side was that this tape of Mitt Romney had been revealed, and this was new. People hadn't heard it before. The news that they then tried to somehow give a balanced view of because of this criticism was uh, 14 years old. And there was no news at all. But it got equal time and equal coverage because of this sensitivity, I think, that our national media has to this particular issue. I don't see it. I, you know, I mean, I watch, I flip channels when there's a debate on. I watch it on five different channels. I watch what happens afterwards on four or five different channels. Uh, you know, I mean, I kind of know that MSNBC is going to go one way. Fox is going to go the other way. CNN is going to try to come somewhere down the middle. Uh, I know that, but I'm an informed consumer. I'm an informed voter. You can't fool me, you know, by distorting the news. And I, I think it's not fair. I just don't see it. I, 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 I concur with Mike, and but I would add on to that a very simple reason. I think the media has one bias only, and that is to make money. And they will follow any story that they think is going to get viewers and traction. It would be simply against their primary purpose, which is to make money and get ratings, to be biased one way or another, except for the specific channels that are obviously biased, MSNBC and Fox. I think that one could argue that there, and I have heard this argument, whether you believe it or not, that the race is actually not as tight as the media is saying it is, which is helping Romney, because they want people to tune in to the end. If they said, Obama's really, you know, in the swing states, guys, look at the electoral votes, it's pretty much going to be, they never said that from the very, even before it really was tight, they were saying, it's tight, it's tight, it's tight. It was driving Axelrod crazy because it just got people to watch. So they've if, done, yeah. They've done the same thing. I, I, uh, I, I don't want to annoy you with this, sir. But, but they've done the same thing with economic reporting. 
if if yeah. there is positive economic news and it leads, I'm very interested in what they choose to lead the nightly news with. You have 23 minutes of network news, which is what a large percentage of people get their information from. You have 23 minutes. What do they lead with? If they lead with positive economic news, and we've had a fair amount of positive economic news in the last couple of months, they always follow that with foreclosure signs, <laughs> you know, with visits to the homes of people who are uh, eating one bean, you know, cutting it up for eight people in the family. There is always some kind of a need to say that no matter what you're seeing on the positive side, it's not as good as all that. I, I resent that not as a, a lefty or a righty or anything else. I resent that because that's not news. That's the same crap I saw yesterday, you know, with the houses in foreclosure. That's the news is that something decent happened today, something good happened. Let's sort of make that a good thing because we need a little optimism in this country right now and not try to bring it down every time. I, and I would also say the media, I think, has two big biases. The first is towards sensationalism. We're saying they want to find something interesting to talk about. So why do we talk about the national debt in China? Because it's dull. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. People do not care about economics because global trade. I, yeah. I, I teach global trade. It is dull. Right. My you students can tell you. <laughs> watch Jim Lehrer. Right. I, and so, well, because you're an AK liberal who wants to watch PBS. Right. Uh, so people don't want to watch that. So it's not sensationalistic. And it's also it's a process story. So it's going on over a long time. It's a process. People don't like that. Uh, third is I've actually, I'm working on a book about, about the media. And so we actually ran the numbers on bias. We have a company in Germany actually codes every night what's on the news and what's on the channels. And I can tell you, uh, ABC and NBC are right at the median. Uh, CBS is a little on the left. NBC is, MSNBC is very much the left. And Fox News is very much the right. So there is a little bit of bias. CBS is a little bit biased towards the left. Uh, the other two broadcast channels are pretty much in the middle. CNN? Uh, CNN's right in the middle with, a, with ABC and NBC. So, numbers. You got it. Don't watch CBS. <laughs> and with that, we do have to bring this to a close. So I want to offer one round of a final round of applause for our panelists.